provided that you're able to get your students open strings in tune, you're going to have a lot of success with clog dance right off the bat when it comes to pitch. Because I would guess something like 50% of the notes in clog dance are open strings. Are we going to get in trouble at a contest or a festival for playing open A's in clog dance? Well, I hope not for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, and, and let's take a look here, measure 11, we have open D, open A, and then in measure 12, fingered B, okay, and violins and violas. So we could play fourth finger D or shift or whatever, and then fourth finger A with vibrato and all this stuff, but it doesn't really match the style of the piece. And remember, this, this clog dance piece is like, um, it, it's, it's that fiddle style. You know, it comes from something like the bluegrass genre from the Appalachian region to the American South. And in that style, the open strings are what's expected. And if you did something different, it would sound, it would sound weird. One of the rules that I give my students for open strings is that most of the time, you don't play an open string if you have to cross for the open string and then cross back. But in this case, it, it doesn't really do that because it, the open A, you also have a B on the A string, and so you can stay uh, on the A string for the B and then play open A again and then cross strings back. You're going to have to cross strings anyway, so we're not just crossing a string to play the open string because we do have that fingered note. So that meets my guidelines for the appropriateness of open strings. The exception here is going to be measure 29, because in measure 29, we have a B, then we have an E, but then we go back down to C sharp. So if we would cross to play open E instead of fourth finger E, that would break my rule. So that would be uh, an instance where I would require my students to play fourth finger E. And guess what? It's just one note, and they should be working on fourth finger some anyway. So I think that should be fourth finger, but a lot of this you can play open. The same thing here in measure 44 in the first violin part. Um, I think that you should really play that fourth finger as well. So again, these open strings can help the overall pitch of your orchestra because they occur so frequently but only if you tune them. And I mean if you tune them, you, the director, tunes the students and make sure that they're in tune. There's not too many things that irritate me at contests and festivals because typically everybody's trying their best. But one thing that, that kind of gets under my skin is when I'm judging in the sight reading room and they come in the door and I, I welcome them and I welcome their students and then I invite them to, to tune their group and sometimes we'll get this comment like, eh, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, yeah, actually, it, it is going to make a difference because there's probably going to be a lot of open strings there. And if those open strings aren't in tune, you're going to be losing points for every single time they play. So at least they can get something right if the open string's in tune. And you, don't you want to give them a little bit of success? At least put in a little effort? Come on. All right, we're going to need to learn the 2-3 pattern or the major pattern. And we get it right off the bat here in measure three and four, where we have this unison from everybody. And we, it's descending sort of. It kind of goes back up to F sharp and back down. But we have the entire tetrachord. We've got D, we've got E, F sharp, G, and A. And that should be your starting point for tuning, making sure all of your students can play up and down that tetrachord perfectly in tune. Isolate that tuning pattern and make sure that they can get all of the notes in tune. The notes that they're probably going to have the most trouble with are F sharp, getting that F sharp high enough, and a lot of them are going to have trouble with G. The reason why they tend to have trouble with the F sharp and the G at, at this level is because of their left hand shape. So you want to make sure that they're playing with straight wrists, that their wrists aren't bent like this, you know, we have the pepperoni pizza rhythm, but we don't want to be holding a pepperoni pizza while playing our instruments. We want to have a straight wrist, and we want to make sure that we have round fingers with tabletops. 
Okay, the next thing we need to do is loosen up that left hand so that they're not squeezing quite so hard because they're squeezing, everything's gonna contract and go back towards the, the first finger and they're gonna end up being flat on the F sharp and especially flat on the G. Now you can tape E, you can tape F sharp and you can tape G and you can make them watch, you know, with the <laughs> their hand right in front of them. Okay, make sure your fingers on the tape, fingers on the tape, fingers on the tape. Okay, that that might not work if they're not able to press down the string firmly enough. They they might be playing flat just because of finger pressure. Okay? And sometimes I've seen directors that have gone and moved the tapes just because they can't push down the string hard enough. And I'm not sure that's the right strategy. I think fixing that hand position and making sure they can push down the string is, is a better long-term option. Maybe the day before a contest or something, you might have to think on your feet. But better long-term option is, is to get them to set up correctly. And one of the things that I like to do is have them pluck the E, pluck the F sharp, and especially pluck that G, and make sure that they can get the ringing sound. Make sure that they have some sustain that goes with that note and that it doesn't just thud. If they're able to pluck the string and they're able to sustain it and, and resonate through the instrument, they're likely pushing the string down hard enough and then they're likely to get consistent tuning with the bow. In the main melody of clog dance, we have Do, Sol, La, 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 Sol, Mi. And a lot of times the F sharp, Mi, is going to be flat, you know, because that's how younger players tend to play. Some of it's mechanical, and we just talked about that earlier. But I think this is a great ear training exercise to go from Sol to Mi, hearing that minor third interval. That's one of those standard Kodai intervals that, that that we teach young children how to internalize. And, and that's a part here where I think that we can really maximize our ear training potential. Have them sing it, have them play from, from A to F sharp, and make sure that they can play the F sharp high enough and in tune. What happens when there are open strings in some instruments, but then in, in octaves or in unison's fingered notes in others? A lot of times this happens in the, in the cellos and basses because the, as they're going up, cellos have the open A, but basses have the open Gs. And so there are some places here, like in measure nine, where cellos are, are playing D and then A and then D. Basses are also playing D, A, and D, but the basses have a fingered A and the cellos are likely to play open A. And then here, measure 16, you've got a finger G in cellos and an open G in the basses. The advantage that you have with this writing is that you have something to tune to. You have that octave to tune to, so the basses can tune to the cellos on A and the cellos can tune to the basses on G. However, if it's out of tune, it becomes very obvious with the fingered note against the open note. You know, we have the same thing here at, at 23, and it's the same kind of idea. We want to make sure that our basses are tuning to the cellos here because they're the ones with the fingered note. And then when they have the, the Gs here a little bit later, what we want to do is make sure that the cellos are now tuning to the basses and listening to each other. There's a lot of strength in numbers in this piece, the way it's orchestrated with the second violin and viola part doubling each other. The cellos and basses double each other almost the whole piece. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, they're doubling. And your first violin section needs to be somewhat independent, but the way it's lined up that way, it makes it easy to teach intonation. There's only one finger pattern that they need to learn, and so it's simple and it's a good starting point for your orchestra to be able to learn concert music and be able to get them develop a culture of tuning while playing a performance.